much. Good to be with you um, again this evening. Um, apologies, we're actually in chapter five this evening. Um, we're just a week behind the initial schedule that was shown due to wanting to do an introduction, etc., to Matthew. Um, so we come to a very special part of the gospel tonight, and that is chapter five. It's again a huge chapter. Um, so many verses found in it, 48 verses. Um, so we'll seek just to lay a foundation to do an overview of the chapter and focus in and highlight on a couple of the things that come out of this. Before we read together, let's not forget the blessing of God's living word, because here we are 2,000 years on, still able to listen to the very same words that the Lord Jesus taught when he was here on earth. And we trust that as we read and consider together this evening, we will sense and hear his voice and his teaching. So let's come to Matthew chapter 5, and we'll select some verses through the chapter. Let's start with the first 12 verses. Um, often known as the Beatitudes, verse number one. And seeing the multitudes, he, the Lord Jesus, went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. How beautiful. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Verse 20, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Then we just select a few of the verses from the reigning section of this chapter, verse 21, listen carefully to this repeated phrase, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Verse 28, but I say unto you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Verse 31, furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Verse 32, but I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality 
causes her to commit adultery. Verse 33, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely. Verse 34, but I say to you, do not swear at all. Verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Verse 39, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. And lastly, in verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Trust the Lord will bless that selected reading from this chapter this evening and just cause each one of us to dwell on this amazing passage of God's word. Right at the outset of this chapter, we're introduced to the mountain scene. And if you've read, as I'm sure you have through the Gospel of Matthew, you may have noticed there are seven different mountain scenes in this Gospel, and that is a study on its own, and we will not go through that tonight. Um, but I think the important point, firstly, for us this evening is the value of the mountain. You see, in Christian life, we're so often bogged down in the valley. And we need those mountain experiences, time alone with the Lord Jesus. And this is a wonderful example of that. And as the disciples come to the mountain, they are able to enjoy his presence and to be taught by him the greatest of all teachers. And as we shall see throughout this chapter and the next two, we view things from a completely different perspective because we're on the mountain seeing things as they really are from God's perspective. And so listening to the words of the Savior, we will be preserved and protected from all the different erroneous teachings that abound in our world today. As we found at the end of chapter four, the Lord Jesus is there healing all who came to him. And so that's a beautiful thought as we step into this chapter on the basis of his actions, on the basis of his compassion and his heart to help. We see him here as the teacher. And Luke tells us as he begins the book of Acts, it's all that Jesus began to do and to teach. You see, as the greatest example of all teachers, the Lord Jesus lays first the moral foundation of doing his actions, his heart, his compassion, so that then as he teaches, all of the people are eager to listen to what he says, because his teaching has power being founded on this moral foundation. And I don't need to remind us this evening of the harm that is done when a teacher's lifestyle does not go hand in hand with his teaching. I did stop and ponder for a little while of the beauty of this statement. Here is Christ sitting on the mountain surrounded by these insignificant human beings who come to listen to him. And we cannot but be amazed that this is the same one who sits on heaven's throne, surrounded by the angelic beings. Oh, the beauty of his compassion, his humility, his desire. But then practically seeing him sitting to teach should tell us the fundamental fact that this teaching is an ongoing process in the life of the Christian, of the individual. It's not just a flash in the pan. This will last throughout our lives here in this world 
and go on into all eternity, sitting at the feet of our Savior. We cannot but be impressed with the type of teaching that he gives. This is the one who is the king in his kingdom. And as many have commented before me, it's as if the Lord Jesus is laying out in these three chapters, chapter five, six, and seven, what he expects of his subjects and the requirements for his subjects. Because as we've commented, it's the disciples, Matthew points out, who come and listen to his teaching. And we're going to find again this evening the huge difference between the wisdom that is from above from heaven and the wisdom that is of this world. You see, Christ will tell us here in chapter five, the source of true blessing, so opposite to, way, to the way the world looks at things. He will focus on the importance of motives and intentions, not just actions. He will teach us how to pray, how we should fast, that we should not worry, that we shouldn't be critical of others, that we should long to enter the narrow door, to make sure we're building our lives on the rock, the sure foundation. So let us come briefly to this section we've titled in the notes as the true blessing. You see, here is Emmanuel. That's how Matthew presents him. Transforming our mindset. This is God with us, bringing heaven's mindset down to earth, seeing things from his perspective. And so teaching us about true blessing. It comes not from pride, not from pushing yourself forward. It comes from being humble, being merciful, thinking of others, being willing to be persecuted, to mourn, to be hungry, to long for righteousness. As I was thinking over this section, an Old Testament example came to mind, that of Jacob. We remember him as the younger son who longed for the blessing of the older son, the birthright and he tried to achieve it through human means. He deceived his father several times over, and instead of bringing him the satisfaction he thought, it resulted in continual problems in his life. Praise God, many years on, as he's wrestled the whole night with God, he cries out for the true blessing, the spiritual blessing, he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. He's come to realize that the blessings of this world are temporary and passing and will never satisfy. And perhaps we need to ask ourselves this evening, what blessing are we truly seeking for? It's interesting to notice that there are nine blessings that the Lord Jesus lays out in this section. And we've put an outline of them in the notes. We cannot go through all of them in detail. Typically, how they apply to the believer, the disciple, the one who is in the kingdom of God. He says, firstly, to be poor in spirit. To have that humble mindset, not thinking that we are something, we are nothing because the Lord Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. To be characterized by this characteristic of mourning, weeping for the souls of the lost, the condition of this world, recognizing from Psalm 126, the one who goes out weeping, bearing precious seed will doubtless come again rejoicing. He speaks about the meek. And I came across a definition, meekness is really gentleness that comes from humility. It's not weakness. It's that gentleness of heart. 
And from that, we're to be clothed with humility, Peter says. And as I thought about that, was Peter thinking back to the very life and example of the Lord Jesus? When in the upper room, he took the servant's role and he clothed himself with the towel. To be hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Longing in this hurting, broken, sinful world to see God's rule and justice established. To be concerned for others, the merciful, the pure in heart, hating that which is evil and pursuing after that which is pure and holy. And it's interesting that is mentioned together in Hebrews chapter 12. Without that holiness, no one will see the Lord. And the blessing that is mentioned here is the pure in heart will see God. And then he speaks of the last three, the peacemakers. And we're told in scripture, as much as in us to live at peace with all men and to be peacemakers and to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace and then he speaks about being persecuted and being mocked following the example of our savior being willing to deny self to take up our cross and to follow him why because we're living for a different reason for a different world and he promises that those who do, do such things will receive great reward in heaven so i leave that for your thought and to go through those items we don't have time to pass through item by item but to notice that clearly the kingdom of god is totally different from any other kingdom you see to enter this kingdom it's not through some human ability or wisdom Actually, it's recognizing our inability, not our suitability. And you see, this kingdom is characterized by a deep concern for the status of others, not about me or my rights. And it's evident in this section that all the subjects of the king are his children. How blessed that is. And they have this longing desire not to live for this world, but to lay down their lives for the king. To take up their cross and to follow him and to know him in a deeper way. And as such, the Lord Jesus promises to his subjects, they will be comforted. They will see God. They will receive heavenly reward. So the question comes, what are we truly living for and looking for the blessings that are transient in this world or the blessings that are divine and heavenly? Again, looking at these verses, they do particularly apply to the disciples. But if you look back in your own lifestyle, the time when you became convicted of your sin and need before God. Were you not poor and humble in spirit, mourning and longing for righteousness, recognizing the slavery of the sinful nature? Destitute and guilty before God. And with that longing to be someone else and yet the inability to change yourself, there was a crying out to God, a longing for righteousness, a different lifestyle. And when you reach that point, that's when God's incredible blessing first came into your life, seen in his power to save and to transform and to make you and I a new creation in Christ Jesus. So while throughout this section, these three chapters of teaching, it is primarily to the believer. We can also apply certain parts of it 
to the unbeliever. Because particularly in chapter 7, Christ will speak about the importance of entering the narrow door. That it's not sufficient to say, Lord, Lord, with the lips. And to make sure that we're building our house upon the rock and not upon the sands. I then just also thought and enjoyed the fact that Christ is always the greatest example of his teaching. And so each of these conditions that he presents, he is their greatest example. He was the one who became poor in spirit. He made himself of no reputation. What amazing humility and love for others, Philippians 2 tells us. He is truly the one who mourned and wept as a man of sorrows in this world, weeping at the grave of Lazarus, weeping over Jerusalem, weeping at the cross. And when we think of meekness, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And when it comes to the cross in his meekness, Isaiah prophesied, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Who but Christ has that real zeal and hunger for righteousness. I was reading recently in Isaiah 42 and enjoying it. The servant of Jehovah, he shall not fail. He will not be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth. He is the one with the true longing to see righteousness in this sin-cursed world. And how can we not think of him as the merciful one? His very words at the cross to those who have put him there. Father, forgive them. The pure in heart, his holy character. The peacemakers, he is the prince of peace. And he made peace by the blood of his cross. He truly was persecuted. For doing right for no reason he was set at naught and he endured the mockery of sinners and so just go through those in your own time and enjoy each condition as it applies to the lord jesus i won't take time but in the notes it's interesting there are nine conditions nine blessings here in matthew 5 and there is a sort of correlation a similarity to the nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. And you can go through that and just enjoy that study for yourself. Let's move on um, to the next section, verse 13 to 16, where the Lord Jesus describes his disciples with two analogies, two characteristics that should be seen in their lives. Firstly, he says, excuse me, you are the salt of the earth. And secondly, you are the light of the world. And he explains the aspect of salt. It adds flavor. It's a preservative. And how about our lives, your and my, yours and mine? Do we add a spiritual flavor and dynamic to society in that preserving way, upholding? The word of God, preserving the heart and mind of God. And we know when you add salt to a meal, it brings that taste, that satisfaction. And if we're working out this aspect of being salt, is not the heart of our father satisfied through that? But then in the second characteristic, the light of the world, light isn't something that should be hid. He says, a city set upon a hill cannot be hid. So do we hide in society? At times, sadly, in shame, denying the name of Christ? Or do we allow our light to shine out? He says they should shine out the character of God. And we should be seen for our good deeds, resulting in God being praised. 
and just as a light is of huge help in the darkness to find your way, we need to shine the light of God into this darkened world to help people find their way to heaven. Let's move on again, because really from verse 17 onwards, there is this aspect of the Lord. And he says, do not think I have come to destroy the Lord. I have come to fulfill. And from verse 21 onwards to the end of the chapter, the Lord Jesus will lay out so clearly the difference between the age of the law and the age of grace. And so before we get into those verses, I have mentioned again in the notes, it's important for us to have some foundation in terms of the law and grace or the law and faith. Certainly during my time in Zambia, there was a lot of attack about this. Um, from the Seventh-day Adventists and others who stand firmly upon the law, not realizing the wonder, the freedom of God's incredible age of his grace, of which you and I are a part. And perhaps we're still thinking that, well, really primarily the Old Testament lays the foundation of the law, and then in the New Testament, we see the foundation of grace. Well, that may be a somewhat simplified version but number one, dear child of God, where'd you start in the Old Testament? It's the whole book of Genesis. And so before you get to the age of the law, God lays out in the first book of the Old Testament the clear fact that faith is the only foundation to a relationship with God long before the law came. And having established that foundation, then in the book of Exodus, we're introduced to the law given to the nation of Israel, God's earthly people. For what reason? To show to us by their example that even though God will bless them abundantly and richly and seek to do everything for them, the human nature is incurable by our own ability. And God lays out the requirements but they're unable to keep it. And so Romans 3 would tell us and remind us that because of their failure, the whole world is guilty before God or confirmed to be guilty before God. Again, before the Lord came, Galatians tells us in chapter 3 that first there was the promise made to Abraham God said to Abraham several times in Genesis, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, not through the law, but through the seed. So Galatians tells us that when the law came 430 years later, it could not annul the promise that had already been made to Abraham. Actually, the law was introduced for a time awaiting the coming of the seed the Lord Jesus Christ. As we step into the New Testament, we are taught that he is the complete revelation of God. He is the one who came to fulfill the law and to bring this new covenant of grace, making salvation available. It is unto all, Romans 3 says, but now the righteousness of God without the law or apart from the law is seen being witnessed by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ unto all and upon all those who believe. You will see shortly in our chapter, six times over the Lord Jesus says, you have heard it was said, but I say unto you, and he will teach us the huge difference between the outward and the inward, between the action and the intention, because that is really what God is looking for. One that has often amazed me is that the law was written on tablets of stone. But in this incredible age of God's grace, we have God himself, the Holy Spirit, resident in our hearts as our teacher, as our helper, as our guide. 
And so salvation, the New Testament, so clearly teaches it's by grace alone, not by any human effort. We're not knocking the Lord. It was good. It was holy. But it was temporary. The law and the prophets effectively said, don't stay with us. Go to the coming one. Christ will be everything. And I know I won't get to this, but in Matthew chapter 17, what a beautiful example of this. Where on the Mount of Transfiguration, you have Moses representing the Lord. You have Elijah representing the prophets. Peter wanting to make a tabernacle for each one, treating Christ the same as Moses and Elijah. And the voice from heaven says, no, 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 no. This is my beloved son. In him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. The age of listening to the law and the prophets is over. We have the full revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. You can follow through other parts of the notes there to see that we are not under the Lord. The New Testament is so clear. We are dead to the law. We've been delivered from the law. The law was powerless to make anything perfect, but Christ has made us perfect forever. We are led by the Spirit and not under the law. We serve God in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the law. And praise God, we boast only in the cross, not in anything else. Coming back briefly to our passage here in verse 17 to 20. The Lord Jesus groups together the law and the prophets. They go hand in hand. They're all the main section of the Old Testament. And he teaches, number one, in verse 17, he did not come to destroy or abolish the law or the prophets. He says not even in verse 18, the smallest detail of the law will disappear until it is all fulfilled. He says, thirdly, in verse 19, to break the least commandment or to teach others to do so is to be least in the kingdom of heaven. And the real, real important one in verse 20, the righteousness that comes from the law is insufficient to enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, to the normal Jewish person, that was a wow statement because they looked at the religious leaders as being capable to keep the law. But Christ says, no, that is not sufficient. Many people have dwelt on the fact, what does it mean to fulfill the law? Well, I would submit to you that surely it's to complete their requirements and accomplish their purpose. You see, the prophet spoke and pointed to Christ. The law was introduced for a time awaiting the coming of Christ. And based upon the righteous requirements of the law, Jesus Christ came into this world to be judged for you and I at the cross and to cry out with a loud voice, it is finished. So that having accomplished everything, he has brought the age of the law and the prophets to an end. For you and I who trust in him. At the end of Galatians, the Apostle Paul says, having looked at this huge difference between the law and faith, he says, I only boast in the cross of Jesus Christ, not in anything else. In Philippians 3 verse 9, he says, I don't want to be found having my own righteousness that comes through the law, but the righteousness of God that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. Praise God, we're in a new phase and a new era today. I have wondered sometimes if Nicodemus might have been listening into these words of Christ, especially in verse 20. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Is that what caused him to seek for the Lord Jesus and to come to have a meeting with him at night? 
questioning these things? We don't know. But I trust we do know, having found the Savior, he found new birth and the true righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, the last section is huge, and we can only just touch a couple of things here. But we need to see, number one, the complete authority of the Lord Jesus. This is the divine revelation the full communication of the heart of God. He is the word. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So on six occasions, and we read them together, he states clearly, you have heard it was said, or you have been taught, but I say unto you six times over. You see, this is the authority of the teacher. This is Emmanuel, God revealing to us his heart and his mind. You see, above and beyond the requirements of the law, Christ came to establish a higher order. You see, the law typically looked at the outward, at the actions, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. But Christ in this section comes to a higher level and he looks at the motive, at the intention behind the action, because that is what is important for God, from God's perspective today. He looks at the inward and it's through his salvation that we are made a new creation. You and I were crucified at the cross. But Christ now lives in us and being under the control of the Holy Spirit. In his power, we are now able to follow these instructions. Very quickly, the Lord Jesus touches on these six items, murder in verse 21 to 26. And he says, you think of murder, but how about anger, which will result in judgment? You look at adultery, verse 27 to 30, but how about the look of lust? That is adultery in the heart. You think of various reasons for divorce. Well, there is only one allowable reason. You speak of making oaths, but your word should be sufficient, a yes or a no. You speak about taking revenge. Well, I'm going to teach you not to resist an evil person. The Lord spoke about hating enemies. He says, I will teach you to love and to pray for them. And as we see each of those things, we have the application that he brings from each situation. And he says, in terms of anger, we need to reconcile with a brother or sister if there is an issue before offering a gift to God. And we need to quickly settle any difference before it comes into court. In terms of adultery in the heart, we need to remove anything in our lives that causes us to sin. Our word should be sufficient. Anything additional comes from the evil one. We should be willing to go beyond what is required, giving to the needy who asks for help. And above all, in all of this, acting as true children of God. As I finish, so much could be said in the whole of this chapter, so many details, but I will just end with a summary in our notes, some of the important things to learn about Christ's kingdom from this section. That of unity, living in unity, one with another, so important that the world may know that the Lord Jesus was sent by the Father. Sin is not just an action, it's also a wrong thought. And the psalmist says, search me, O God, and know my thoughts, try me and know my ways, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Number three, institute marriages instituted by God 
as a lifelong relationship. We should be trustworthy, people who keep their word. And revenge, that is the work of God. It's not ours. We're to love our enemies in the power of God. And lastly, the incredible kindness of God. He causes the rain and the sunshine to shine on all, no matter their response to him. And it's that goodness of God that should lead people to repentance. So may the Lord just encourage us this evening with this teaching of Christ. The king lays out the requirements for his kingdom points us to the source of true blessing, reminds us to be salt and light in this world, and then with authority confirms that he is the full revelation of God and he comes to bring in a new order, a new covenant. Praise God by his grace, salvation, which is his gift, indwelt and led by the Holy Spirit of God. Let's give thanks this evening, Father. You have given us an opportunity to dig a little in your word tonight. This amazing teaching that the Lord Jesus gave 2000 years ago. Oh Lord, help us to change, change our mindset, our outlook, to long for the true blessing to live for another world. We're just passing through. And so often the world tries to force us into its mold. Be exalted, we pray. Thank you for each one at Fifth Avenue. Pray your blessing, your overruling, your growth and development, your oneness and unity a love for the lost. Oh Lord, to be truly children of the King. We bow before you. Give thanks for your grace and love, for blessing us with your word. And we bow in the precious and worthy name of the one who is Emmanuel, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen.